Hello everyone, what's up? In tonight's video I'll show you how I painted and weathered these Warlord Titan armor panels from Adeptus Titanicus from start to finish. This video was commissioned by Amy, one of my oldest top tier Patreon supporters. Whether you're a wargamer or a scale modeler, if you want to learn more about weathering, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell. As I usually do with plastic models, I opted to undercoat the armor panels with Tamiya XF paints with lacquer thinner instead of using a primer. I mixed flat black and a whole red in equal parts and then diluted this mix 50% with lacquer thinner. This combo has a lot more bite than any acrylic primer, creates a very tough base for future weathering stages and it's a pleasure to spray with no clogging or dry tip whatsoever. Even if you were to spray a huge piece like an entire 28mm Titan. Here is what the finished undercoat looked like. As most of my Patreon supporters will know, lately I've been experimenting with this product from Ammo of MIG called Anti-Slip Paste, originally created to replicate the anti-slip surfaces on some modern military vehicles, like the Israeli Merkava tanks, this is a very easy to use acrylic paste, which I'm using with sci-fi models like this in order to create a rough metal texture, which I believe really enhances the liquid mask chipping technique that I prefer to use. To apply the product, simply take a flat brush and stipple it onto the surface. While Ammo recommends applying two layers and even in the surface out with a sponge, I find that this is unnecessary for my type of application. The anti-slip paste goes on very easily and creates a very interesting texture which I really loved on these pieces. However, I've done two with and two without in order to show you how the finishes may vary. The product will be dry to the touch after a couple of hours, but it will take up to 24 hours to cure completely. I applied this also to a really huge 3D printed tank from Grim Prince called the Grim Mouse and I found that it really enhanced the finish. For models like Machine and Kriga or anything that's supposed to have a sort of post-apocalyptic theme, I think this could be a very interesting option. Now for what is probably the most important step in the whole process. We're going to apply Humbrol Muscal with a bit of kitchen sponge held with pliers in order to create realistic chipping effects. My apologies for the lighting here guys, I forgot to close the window in front of my desk and the natural lighting resulted in massive overexposure, but hopefully you can still make out the details. First we unload most of the product onto some kitchen paper just as if we were dry brushing. Then we're going to gently dab our sponge at the surface. Here you can see how I begin to apply the liquid mask onto one of the texturized panels. Many people have asked me whether it would be possible to apply chipping effects at this scale, particularly with my preferred liquid mask technique. I think these images are definitive proof that this is indeed possible. You can see that I'm applying little dots of liquid mask rather than any big blobs. This does take some practice, but as I always tell my students, if I can do it, so can you. Ok, so that is the first panel done. Now let's have a look at how I apply the liquid mask to a flat panel. As you can see, for now it's pretty much the same story. The differences will appear in later stages. By the way, if you want to see a dedicated, in-depth look at liquid mask chipping, check out my eponymous tutorial. Ok, so it's time to apply our base coats. I'm going to show you how I painted two panels, one white and one green, both texturized. Let's start with the white one. I went with Tamiya XF2, mixed in equal parts with Tamiya lacquer thinner and sprayed it around 20 psi. I bet all of you know just how hard it is to airbrush white paint, right? This combo will allow you to airbrush even the largest of models without any dry tip or clogging. But don't take my word for it. Here you can see how I start applying it in a very thin mist. I'm only letting a minimal amount of paint through the airbrush whilst continuously depressing the trigger. 
This is basically what you could call a dry tip torture test. However, the paint goes on very smoothly and I'm able to build opacity gradually, which in turn will make for a tougher finish. Which by the way is something that this piece is going to really need, as you will see later. So here the piece is approaching complete opacity. As you can see, I've gone for a simple, flat white finish, just as the name of the paint indicates. Future weathering stages will create a lot of contrast and tonal variation, and in any case, if your thing is fancy airbrush transitions, you're probably watching the wrong channel. So, this is pale green from the AK Real Colors line, again with my favorite Tamiya thinner. Same dilution and same pressure as before. This true lacquer paint goes on even more easily than Tamiya XF paints. In this case, I did apply some highlights after reaching complete opacity, but that I finished off camera. So, on to the main event. As you can see, I am viciously attacking the paint with an old flat brush. The concept here is twofold. First of all, I am removing the little dots of liquid mask, obviously, that were applied previously, but secondly, the degree of friction that I'm applying is also creating microchips and scratches. In this case, we're also taking advantage of the texture from the anti-slip paste. This use of friction is what I call mechanical weathering. Now let's have a look at the smooth green panel instead. Similar results, but with less microchipping, I would say. Time for a white, rough metal panel. Here is where the real magic happens, I think. See all those minuscule dots? This is what I was really going for from the start. I have to say that I enjoyed this so much that I was chuckling while doing it. And lastly, here you can see how I applied scratches deliberately using the metal parts of the brush. Why paint scratches if you can actually create them, right? What do you think is going to look more realistic on your model? Time for our gloss varnish. I'm using Tamiya Clear, thinned 50% with lacquer thinner. This is very easy to apply and creates a very smooth gloss finish which will help both with the pin wash and with the decals. Unlike with the paints, here I'm taking a more heavy-handed approach, finishing with what some people call a wet coat. With this lacquer thinner, the product dries so fast that there is basically no waiting required. So here's the finished texturized panel. Of course, the varnish isn't going to make the texture go away, so you will need a good decal solution. By contrast, applying the varnish on this second, smooth green panel was comparatively easier, and of course we got a much shinier finish in the end. Speaking of decals, I use my favorite decal solution, which is by far the most effective and user-friendly one I've tried, and I've tried many. If you would like a dedicated video for this product, check out my Tamiya Mark Fit Strong tutorial. To begin with, I applied the product quite liberally onto the surface. Then I waited for 15 minutes for it to dry, and then I applied a decal with tweezers and tried to position it as well as I can. Now, I don't know about you, but I can never get them in the right place on the first try. In fact, I kept fiddling with some of them for quite a while. After waiting for another 15 minutes or so, I coat the decal again with Tamiya Mark Fit Strong. Yes, you heard correctly, it's one product to rule them all. Not one for fixing and one for softening. This very rough texture is a challenge, of course, which is why I kept going over the decal with the applicator brush. In order to be really sure that there wouldn't be any air bubbles or whatever, I went over the surface with a cotton bud, applying some pressure. Of course, this wouldn't be a risk for Terra video if I didn't make some kind of horrendous mistake in the process, so here you go. With this white panel, I got so enthusiastic with the cotton bud that I actually tore parts of the decal. 
Wait for it. Here you can see my shame in slow motion. Unperturbed by this accident, however, I got my tweezers out and then applied some real damage to all the decals. Regretfully, I stuck my head in front of the camera during almost the whole time, so here you can see a tiny bit of footage in slow motion. I hope that you get the idea. Anyway, this was now a last coating, just to make sure that the damaged parts wouldn't lift. If you look closely, you will see that I added some more scratches to the paint with the tweezers as well. The undercoat we applied is so tough that it withstood all of this abuse quite happily. In preparation for the dreaded painting trim stage, I applied liquid mask all around the area. The idea was to protect our work as much as possible, even if it was varnished. In keeping with my philosophy of focusing on weathering, rather than on artistic brush painting, I went for the well-known Sharpie hack. Painting even this super small trim with a Sharpie is quite easy, giving us a good base coat for a fraction of the time and effort needed with a brush. The next step, or sub-step if you prefer, is to stipple a more realistic and brighter metallic paint onto our very basic base coat. This is the True Metal Brass by AK Interactive, which is a wax-based paint. Yes, that's right, it's not an oil paint, but a kind of wax. I applied the paint undiluted with a sponge, which is one of several ways that you can use this product. After unloading the excess on a bit of kitchen paper, again just like dry brushing, I then dabbed it onto the face of the trim, trying to create as random a pattern as I could. Next in our weathering process is the all-important pin wash. For this I used my trusty Ammo Dark Wash, which is an enamel, mixed with some odorless thinner. Roughly two parts wash to one part thinner. The idea of course is to use capillary action as much as possible, allowing the wash to flow by itself rather than painting with it, so to speak. As you can see, I was struggling to hit those rivets, even with the magnifying lenses that I was actually wearing. Again, if you would like a dedicated tutorial for just the pin wash technique, I would be happy to oblige. So, unless you're a first-time watcher of the Race for Terra, you will know that I always blend or clean up the enamel washes with a brush and some thinner. This time, however, I wanted to show you guys a new product by Ammo of MIG that I think can be a pretty good alternative, at least when you have large flat panels like those of an aircraft model. For this to work optimally, the wash should be dry, but obviously not cured. In this case, I waited for around 4 hours before blending. As always, your mileage may vary depending on thinning, temperature and other variables. Bear in mind as well that the varnish that I had applied prior is also facilitating the blending process. But anyway, let's have a look, shall we? As you can see, what I'm doing is basically pushing or dragging the wash, which even on these super small panels is quite easy to do. Since the sponge is very soft, there is no risk of damaging anything and its surface will absorb the wash without any difficulties, even with this rough finish. Time for another varnish. I applied a matte varnish, in this case Tamiya Flat, before I moved on to the finishing stages. Now this wasn't necessary strictly speaking, and I could also have done it at the very end. But I wanted to make sure that the enamels and oils I would apply in the last two steps would not reactivate my pin wash. By the way, I call this a matte varnish, but at least when applied with Tamiya Lacquer Thinner, this product actually has a slight satin finish. Personally, I find that the perfect base for using oils, and also just a beautiful finish in itself. The oils I was referring to before are the Ammo of Make oil brushers, which unlike traditional ones, are slightly pre-thinned and come with an applicator brush. In my opinion, they are ideal for either the oil dots filter technique, or in this case, creating streaking effects. To apply it, I just paint a little dot, unthin, and then drag the oil pen gently downwards with the brush in order to create the streaks. If you're not happy, you can always remove the streaks using a flat brush, slightly dampened with thinner. 
Now I've tried many different products for streaks, like the dedicated streaking enamel effects, but unthinned oil brushers are my current favorite for this technique. Many other YouTubers have complained that the applicator brushes are not fun enough or that this whole product is like a marketing gimmick, but personally they are one of my preferred weapons in my weathering arsenal. I would really encourage you to give them a try. The very last step in painting and weathering these armor panels was supply a verdigris or copper oxide wash to some of the metallic areas. For this I used one of my AK Abteilung oils, which I now almost never used to be honest because of the superior ease of use of the oil brushers. I applied a pea-sized dot to the pin well, which turned out to be far too much, and then added some thinner. Since the proportions are impossible to judge accurately, I just played it by ear. The main thing of course was to create the consistency of a wash. I then used my trusty liner brush, highly recommended by the way, to apply it to some spots in a more or less random fashion. It was quite hard for me to hold both the brush and the model steady, as you can see, but overall it was a very easy job and I think it really added to the finish. Speaking of finish, here are the finished panels. I was very happy with the results, particularly with this first white panel. You can decide for yourselves, but personally I just love the rough metal finish with that extra gritty texture added. Whether or not you collect or play Adeptus Titanicus, I hope that you have enjoyed this video and that we have proven that it is indeed possible to create chipping and other weathering effects on very small scale models. As those in my Discord community will know, I'm going to be on holidays from now until mid-August and I'll also be taking a break from YouTube during that time. However, come September, you can expect more weathering videos from me, particularly with Star Wars models, which is a genre that I want to focus on more in the future. Speaking of Patreon, this video was commissioned by Amy, one of my top tier supporters, all of who get to ask me for a video on a particular topic. A big thank you to all of you guys for helping me make this channel possible. So this is the Race for Terra signing off for now. Thank you all, and remember, keep it up and weather it out.